topics we are going to focus on. First of all, we want to know what really happens in gastrointestinal function in our critically ill patients. Second is what are the effects of enteral nutrition? And third, do different formulas have different effects? The first main difference between us and our critically ill patients is the fact when we see food and we smell food, salivation starts, GI secretion starts. This is something our critically ill patients do not have. And the second problem is that fluid absorption is very much increased in our patients, especially from the colon. Almost all the fluid is reabsorbed. We have changes in blood flow when we eat or feed somebody. This is a study in healthy volunteers, and you see that the increase of blood flow depends on the formula you give your subject or your patient. Um, here you have a high carbohydrate meal, and you see there is a short peak, a short increase, which goes down very fast. And this is a high fat meal, and you see that this increase is much more pronounced and much more prolonged. The same uh, data were shown in the publication by SIM. Um, you see there is an increase in healthy volunteers uh, of blood flow after feeding, and there is a difference to our critically ill patients. Some of them are able to increase perfusion, others do not, and in some patients, perfusion goes down. So when you start to feed, you have to be sure that at least basic perfusion to the gut is okay. We have disturbances of GI motility. We have a problem with our fasting pattern, the migrating motor complex. It's called the housekeeper because it has to expel all the food remnants in the gut into the colon to prevent um, bacterial overgrowth. And we have a um, problem because it does not start in the stomach. It has a prolonged and a dominating phase one. This is the period of quiescence. And we have a, a problem with phase three because it often runs retrograde, retrograde back from the colon to the stomach, so it expels the food remnants back to the small bowel. We have disturbances of the feeding pattern. You heard about gastroparesis. Uh, we have problems with small bowel motility, and there are problems in the colon with the reduction of mass mov movements and a significant reduction of the gastrocolic reflex. And there is also a problem with the switch from the fasting to the feeding pattern. This is a fasting pattern, MMC3. When you feed your patient, you have a leg phase. This is a period of some minutes where nothing happens. And after this, in healthy volunteers, the feeding pattern starts. The problem we have in our uh, critically ill patient is that this start of the feeding pattern does not happen or you need higher caloric loads to uh, start this switch. There also is a problem with microflora. You have an increase of uh, problematic uh, um, parts of the microflora. You have a decrease of the beneficial uh, bacteria like uh, bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. They are important because they have an anti-inflammatory effect and they do stimulate motility and they uh, stimulate the production of immune globulin A. And microflora produces short-chain fatty acids, and these uh, short-chain fatty acids like butyric acid stimulate motility, and the gas production like mesen or CO2 also stimulate motility. We also have differences in absorption. This is a study done in patients after uh, aortic aneurysm surgery. And this is the absorption of carbohydrates. The white um, dots are the healthy uh, patients or the healthy volunteers and the absorption of carbohydrates. 
then we have the absorption uh, of our patients on the first day. You see, it's much lower, and there is an increase to normal on the third day. When we look at the absorption of fats, this is normal, this is the absorption on the first day, and on the third day, it's not, it did not reach normal values. But the reasons why our GI function is decreased are manifold. There also is a reason because of high blood glucose. A blood glucose value of 200 doubles the time the stomach needs to empty. And this is a, a slide that shows you that uh, patients with high blood, glu blood glucose values had more feeding intolerance compared to those who did, normal have, did have normal values. And this is a slide which shows you the effect of uh, catecholamines on motility. This is the normal peristalsis of a um, guinea pig small bowel segment. Then you give epinephrine and you see that uh, the, the bowel segment is paralyzed. And then you start neostigmine, for example, and you can restore peristalsis, but only in low dosages. When you increase the dosage, because you think that higher doses are more beneficial, then you have a paralysis again because of spastic contractions. <clears throat> I think it's important to realize that feeding our patient is just one piece of the puzzle, but not, uh, it doesn't, it's not the whole solution. So what's the effect of enteral nutrition on GI function? This is a study in dogs. They looked at different parts of the GI tract. These are the dogs who stayed fasted, and these are the fed animals. And you see that especially in the upper GI tract, in stomach and duodenum, motility restores to normal much faster. There is no significant difference in the distal part of the small bowel. Enteral nutrition also reduces gastroparesis. This is a study in humans undergoing pancreatic surgery. A retrospective study, the first group of uh, patients operated before 2005. They did not receive enteral nutrition. And the second group received enteral nutrition until oral alimentation was, po uh, was possible. Important was that the feeding tube was placed near the ligament of trites, and uh, the incidence of gastroparesis was lower in the, uh, in the group who received enteral nutrition. There also was a significant reduction of hemorrhage. There was no difference uh, regarding postoperative pancreatic fistula between the fed group and the group uh, who did not receive enteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition also improves transit. This is a um, study in rats, a sham operated group, and a second group where uh, ligation on the superior mesenteric vein was placed. And when you do this ligation, you have a an hyperema and an edema of the, the small bowel. And you see, when you feed these two groups, you have an increase of intestinal transit in the sham operated group, but also a significant increase in the group with gut edema. Enteral nutrition also preserves intestinal mucosa. Uh, rats with abdominal infections were divided into three groups. The first group received parental nutrition, the second group enteral nutrition, and the third group enteral nutrition in combination with probiotics. And you see that um, especially in the third group, there was a better a composition of microflora because the amount of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria significant, significantly increased and the amount of uh, pathogenous uh, parts of the microflora decreased. 
What the authors found is that the amount of immunoglobulin A secreted was significantly higher in the two groups receiving enteral nutrition in the small bowel and the colon. And there was a significantly higher expression of oclodin, that's a transmembrane binding protein that shows you that your tight functions are okay. And here you see a um, histologic uh, picture of, uh, the, uh, of intestinal mucosa in the parenterally fed group. This Uh, is, shows you a lot of destruction of intestinal mucosa, and here they this is a wonderful picture of a well-preserved intestinal mucosa. So. Uh, enteral nutrition modulates bacterial translocation, study in humans, the same concept, parental nutrition, enteral nutrition, and the third group, enteral nutrition plus probiotics. The feeding tube, again, placed uh, near the ligamentum of trites. And the authors also did evaluation of the stool microbiota and cytokine levels. And what they showed is that um, the microbiota was preserved in the fed groups and that this was associated with a significant reduction of complications. Pancreatic sepsis is significantly lower in these two uh, feeding groups. The same is with multiple, uh, multiple organ failure and mortality. And they also were able to demonstrate a significantly difference in cytokine secretion. Here you have uh, endotoxin values and you see in the parental group, the endotoxin values are highest compared to the two uh, groups who received enteral nutrition. And when you look at anti-inflammatory cytokines like uh, interleukin-10, you see that there also is an increase of the anti-inflammatory cytokines in the feeding groups compared to the group who did only receive parental nutrition. Last but not least, let's have a look at different formulas and their effect on GI function. From the microbiota, we know that fiber-enriched uh, preparations are beneficial because they uh, have a higher amount of lactobacillus and this uh, stimulates the liberation of immune globulin A, so a fiber-enriched formula might exert an anti-inflammatory effect. And uh, we also know that, for example, fish oil supplementation enhances the recovery of gut microbiota, that they increase uh, bacteroides and lactobacillus in the microbiota. There is a difference between increasing calorie load and increasing osmolari osmolarity. These are 16 volunteers. The group one received formulas with increasing calorie load, and the second group uh, received a formula with increasing osmolarity. And uh, what the authors were able to show that there was a comparable lag phase. The switch from the fasting pattern to the feeding pattern, the lag phase in both groups was about nine minutes. And this was not different between the different formulas. And they also were able to demonstrate that none of the patients had a relapse to the fasting pattern. But the group uh, with different caloric loads had uh, higher caloric loads, did not have higher effects on intestinal transit but there was a significant difference uh, in uh, different formulas with uh, different osmolarities. The higher osmolarity is, the more transit is, uh, is, goes down. Is there a difference between gastric and duodenal feeding? Um, the authors found 
that when they fed their patients via a gastric route, 50% of the patient had, patients had a relapse of the micro uh, MMC, that's the fasting pattern, and there was no relapse of the fasting pattern in the group who received uh, the enteral nutrition in uh, post pyloric. The reason for this is you have a significantly higher liberation of CKK in the group who receive enteral nutrition into the duodenum, and this is a more uh, inhibitory effect on the fasting pattern. What about duodenal lipids? Uh, when you uh, have formulas with different content of lipids, the higher the amount of lipid is, the higher is the liberation of inhibitory hormones, CKK, you heard in the first lecture by Adam, and PYY. This is a, a protein which is very, very much involved in jejunal break, ileal break, uh, reduction of transit in order to give the gut the opportunity to absorb the lipids uh, applicated. And there also was a significant uh, relationship between appetite and energy intake and uh, the lipids in the enteral nutrition. So my take home message for you is that the inhibitory effects on gastrointestinal function are manifold. Just feeding your patient is one step, but not the whole solution. There are, there are beneficial effects due to enteral nutrition. You have improved gastric emptying, a lower rate of gastroparesis. You have an increase in intestinal transit. Intestinal mucosa is preserved. You have lower rates of bacterial translocation. You maybe have lower rates of hemorrhage and you have a better preserved microflora and lower cytokine levels. The higher the osmolarity of your preparation is and the fat content, the more pronounced is the inhibitory effect on GI transit. And of course, there is a difference in the route of application. Uh, a duodenal application has a better suppression of the fasting pattern compared to the intragastric application. Thank you for your attention.